yeah, it's not really a question. It's, it's, it's a discussion that I have with a lot of people is how do you build a relationship with a practitioner or a doctor, right? Because a lot of doctors are going to look at a lifter and say, it's just a stupid fucking meathead. And sometimes it's true, right? And a lot of the meatheads are going to look at the doctor and say, well, he doesn't know shit. Stupid you know, he that. doesn't know anything. Right. right. So, and a lot of times, I mean, people just think they can go to the doctor and get written prescriptions for whatever it is, but there's a relationship that has to be built yeah. and there's, there's issues on both sides. Right. So it's their question is, you know, how do you build that relationship? If they, first off, they have to, that's, they have to do their due diligence. They have to find a good physician or, you know, practitioner right. that's on them. Right. Right. That's not on that. That's just how it is. How do they go about doing that? Ask around. Yeah. You know, and you, you can't just, I'm going to go, I don't want to go on a rant. You can't wait <laughs> go until, <laughs> until you, until you blow a pack out or yeah. blow a knee out. And then you go to ER and then when you're in ER, they're going to assign you a, an orthopedic who's on rounds, who the really best orthopedics do everything in their power to not be on rounds, which means, Absolutely. Which they means don't want to be there. Yes. Which means you're not going to get the best <laughs> orthopedic. And this one's going to end up doing the surgery. Have a plan before you tear something off. Like, who's the best orthopedic? And do I sound paranoid? Yeah, but I'm telling you, you, you need time. You have a lot of experience with that. Yeah, you need time. You can't, even, even when I would do it, and was in that situation, like, nope, look, as long as I'm not dying, I'm, get me out of here. I need, <laughs> I need to call and ask some people what's going on because you got to understand. But they do, they wait too long, and then boom, and then they have some botch bullshit, you know, that kind of happens that way. But let's say they do find, you know, a practitioner therapist and, it, and it's good. Now they walk in, there's going to be a certain bias with most, right? They're, they're going to look at and meet him. I even have the bias. When yeah. you walk in or you send me some, oh shit, that's another, <laughs> yeah. another muscle. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Okay. Yes. So then how do, how do they, this is the, from, from them, how do they build that relationship, you know, with say you guys so you understand that they're on that same page? Okay. So, I'm going to take that question because... I suffer that, okay? And the reason I say that, there's two types of doctor. One is the one that has a big ego. Mm -hmm. And, it, oh, Dave, you told that because I don't want to say this, you, oh, you take testosterone. Testosterone, yes. Oh, absolutely. Then there's another one that initially thinks that way, but also like, let me listen to the patient. So the first thing that I think is mutual respect. And I want to say this because I'm gonna, the best sample here is me and Dave used to have arguments, actually truly real arguments in the in my room they would leave that's that's uh, you don't know shit and he would leave right but when you show respect to a patient and i'm going to go from the physician first side mm -hmm. when i show respect to that patient that patient always wants to come back now how does the patient approaches me one is and this is the non-ego doctor bring me information that you have i read about this i read this i saw this if this is no google this is research. Now, to the ego doctor, if you bring those papers, you bring this information, they're going to take it the wrong way. I know this is going to sound condescending, but I would say with the ego doctor, I'd say my stupid. And I know this is going to sound crazy, but say, hey, listen, I hurt my shoulder. I think I did it this, this way. And, I, and, and you know, I don't know how I did it, but I think I did it this way. That doctor with the ego says, oh, this guy doesn't know as much. Let me help him. One, two is make sure that you do not push the conversation because as soon as you start pushing the conversation, they back off. Oh, this guy knows it all. This guy's not gonna work for me. You know, I don't wanna deal with this, which I know that I like that on my office, but most doctors don't like that. Three, sit there and listen to the doctor. Even though if he says that you're black, but you're white or white and you're black, Listen to him. Once you listen to what he presented, then ask him and write it down. Do you mind answering these questions for me? If you don't have time now, please let me know later. This is one of the biggest things that I've seen because I do teach residents and I teach students, medical school, nurse practitioners. As soon as the patient says, can you please this answer for me later? Or can you please give me a call? But I, You can write a hundred questions, but write it. I know you don't have the time, but can you please do this? That opens the door for that doctor to be able to contact you later. I agree. I, I think the biggest thing, and I saw this with you, that you know you sustained a, a leg injury, and you reached out to me. You already had a team. 
And I said, you know what? Try this, 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 and this. And he went, oh, okay. And I said, we got to find out how bad this is. Talk to Jeremy. He's down the street. You know, so you went down and you got mm -hmm. the ultrasound and everything else. And so you have a team of people that from different pathways, you know, that you can get to where you want as far as the recovery and then build it from there. I think the other thing is that when you're dealing with a chiropractor or a medical doctor or anything else, ones that use, you know, pieces of paper, I have a big whiteboard. You, every time I go to Eric's place, we go downstairs in the basement and it's a three hour lecture on the whiteboard, which is awesome because it's, it's space age information. Use the whiteboard to explain stuff. Most people cannot, they don't understand the verbiage. They don't understand the language, the, the lexicon. You know, if I start using terms that the patient has no idea, if I say, you know, you're a chromioclavicular joint, and they're like, what is that? But if I have a picture beside it, I see this joint right here, and they're like, oh, okay. And I use the whiteboard, and I plan out as far as their path to recovery to lifting more. And the classic example was Ken Wetham. Ken uh, came to me, he reached me on uh, Facebook, and he said, listen, I'm, 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 uh, I think at that time he had won the world's uh, in his category, and he said, I, I, I want to squat 900, but it starts bothering me at 400 pounds, and can I, um, you know, I'm squatting over 800, but I want to get to 900. I went, great. You know, so he came in, and, you know, we worked on him, and he's, he was very diligent, and I did everything possible, and we, we got him to a 900-pound squat. And Ken's 50, he was 52 mm -hmm. at the time, and he goes, you think we can do a thousand? I went, absolutely. Let's do it. You talk to most doctors, their very first thing would be, why would you want to do that? You want someone who's enthusiastic that sort of goes, yeah, let's, let's do everything possible. So I went to meets and helped him out. And then I'd go to his training facility in his garage and he would help me and everything else. And you build that personal relationship, but someone that number one understands training and also is enthusiastic about you doing more versus questioning your, why are you even doing that? You should, why don't you, why don't you do something else? Can't you just use machines? That, that's what they told me. I was getting ready for the national championships in powerlifting two weeks before. I was squatting over 500 at the time. Two weeks before, uh, right tendon. It sounded like a bed sheet ripping. And so I was out and I've spent eight months seeing medical doctors. He said, just do leg extension. Didn't know what he's talking about. Massage, physio, everything else. Finally, a small little chiropractor, you know, Merv Ritchie, weighed 130 pounds. His arm was about this big. Starts doing muscle testing. Right side, no strength. Left side, full strength. This is eight months after. I could squat 400, but after that, I couldn't, I couldn't squat more. It was too painful. And he says, your knee healed a long time ago. He says, uh, it's coming from your back. And I went, what? So started doing back adjustments and the whole SI joint was torqued. He took x-rays and you could see it. So it was a neurological inhibition, but would only show up once the weight got heavier. I could run, I could go up and down stairs. My knee pain was non-existent until I was squatting and I forced it. And people are like, well, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, it's no different than your car. If you're driving your car at say 60, uh, 30 miles an hour, Steering wheel's fine, everything else. But if the wheel's out of balance and you're going 60, 70, the steering wheel starts shaking. You could replace the steering wheel, it'll still shake. Sometimes the pattern is further down. My knee was, uh, had healed, but the low back, so literally after three weeks of uh, treatment, I was back squatting over 500 and I'm going into powerlifting contest, you know, at age 59, you know, next week. You know, so I'm, you can be longevity but you need a team and you need someone that says, yeah, this, this is what the problem is. If someone can't give you, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, if someone can't give you the answer to it, find someone else. Absolutely. That's, you talk about a team, the doctors have a team because if I send Dave to another doctor, yes. if I send it to a person that's going to think, oh, he's, he's taking testosterone, that's why it happened, I don't want to send him there. Right. That's why I like to make phone calls to the doctors, which I rarely People, I don't think doctors do that anymore. Also, one thing that I want you to tell every person that is a patient out there, there, there are doctors that feel sorry for you, which is okay. It's a human response, a human feeling, 
but the one that shows compassion is the one that truly is going to help you. Yeah. Let me say this again. There are people, oh, I feel sorry for you. You screw up, you know. But the person that shows compassion wants to help you fix that issue. Be aware of that. And you can tell who person is going to feel sorry for you. Ah, if, you know, it's okay. You know, it's, it happens. That's the person that feels sorry for you. The patient says, really, how did it happen? When did it happen? They start asking you the questions. It's that's the, the person that's going to show. You yeah. want the enthusiasm. Where, where I see most of the issues from, I don't see them because, as you just said, you, my referrals are vetted. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody will go into a doctor, specialist, or whatever it is. It doesn't matter what the issue is. It's because they're on testosterone. Yes. So it's so what I've kind of suggested out there is that if that's where they always go first, to me, it's a red flag. Because let's say you're ill and you go there and they say, well, it's the testosterone, go off. What if you have freaking cancer? Right. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? So, you know, with, with that, it, it's still building that relationship. But I think Eric made a really good point of having a list of questions because yes. even if they're going to be combative and say, yes, your test levels are 150, that's fine. You don't need a hormone optimization. Then in your list of questions, you know, you'll, you'll ask more specific questions. And if they can't yes. answer them, you find somebody else. Yeah. You know, I, this is not an easy thing to navigate. No. I, I think that's what they're kind of yes. also misunderstanding is how many, I, I, you go through a ton of practitioners and doctors until you find yeah. that, that one person. Then once you find the right one, they have a network. Yes. Yes. Th then you Absolutely. rely on their network, but you got to spend a lot of time finding that right one, especially when you're talking about hormone optimization, because that, you know, most doctors, and this is another reason why it's a red flag, and it's, I'm going to kind of bash your industry a little bit. You know, there, <laughs> there's not a lot of hormone replacement people coming into their office buying them lunch, you know, lobbying them, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, so, and I'm, I'm not a doctor, one sitting here. You know, I think a lot of the epidemic with antidepressants is who's visiting the office the most. Absolutely. That's why they say women have more depression. No, women go more to the doctor. But I see the same men. If you ask the question, they're depressed too. It's just, we don't yes, ask them. Yes. Or they don't offer it. And they don't want to go to the doctor because of their weakness. No, right. there's more women depressed. No, it's because more women go to the doctor and complain, I am depressed, which is bogus, you know, but. Yeah, so it's, I'm taking it a little bit different route is, you know, a lot of doctors don't really continue their education. That is correct. Right. And there, there is a, there's, there's a low testosterone epidemic. One of the questions was how, how much have you seen the testosterone? Low? There's a low testosterone epidemic. So to me, if somebody's going in because they have low testosterone, the doctor's like, no, you don't, and all this other stuff, and they're not even looking. I'm like, no, wait a minute. This isn't almost, it's an epidemic. If they're not keeping up on this, that is correct. which is very basic, then they're also not keeping up on this, 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 or this, which means most of their education is coming from the sales reps, the drug sales reps who are coming in during their lunch. This is not a doctor I want to talk to. Anything that's super basic like that, they should be able to know. So it's a red flag. Um, and that's, I don't, it's more work. Yeah. You know, but if I'll. 60% I'll, of the doctors, once they graduate, they don't, they, oh, I learned what I needed to learn. Yeah. I might read something here and there. I know it. Don't worry about it. That is a very bad weakness that I see of us, our MDs at least. I read every single day between five to seven papers. I don't, I sit in the bathroom. I was sitting right here in your bathroom and I was reading a paper, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I was lactate. I know that sounds stupid, mm -hmm. but that's what we were arguing about the last, last, last night. night. <laughs> so I'm reading the paper because I want to know more about what he was talking about. Most doctors don't do it anymore. I ask my patients in my office, bring me research paper that you have on it. I have learned so much more from patients bringing me research papers that I go, oh my God, I never thought about it. But again, my ego's laughed because I have been beaten up really bad. You beat me in a few points. I said, Ken beat me in a few points. I said, I got to learn this. I, got, I didn't know anything about it. Let me go and learn. When the doctors sit there and they say they know it all, go somewhere else. Yeah. So okay. with, with um, low testosterone, free and total, the, I think the question was the age group 20 to 30. How, how much have you seen that increase? Oh, my in God. Last? And then this, why? This Are, is a great question. And actually, first of all, we established 
levels of testosterone based on a sick population because we don't do tests on the healthy population. They're not going to show to the doctor. So immediately average, remember, we do this, doc, we do this, this blood test on people that are either on the hospital or they're sick. Mm -hmm. We never use healthy people. So that's one thing that I think that the research that the levels that give us, which by the way, they currently change. Now normal levels are down to 210, by the way. That's normal. So we're seeing, well, wow. we're seeing a lowering of the lower levels of testosterone. So that means you, quote unquote, you might see less because not because we're having more, it's because we're lowering the numbers that are required to be called low, right? Well, it's called symptomatically normal. Yes. It's so called, you're normal, but you but have all the symptoms. Yes. So they don't treat that. Now to answer Dave's questions, Sadly enough, I'm seeing more and more people that are low on testosterone that they don't even know it. I'm not talking about you come to my office, hey, I want to check my testosterone levels. I think they're low. It's me doing the test. And I said, oh my God, what is this? For example, I saw a 23-year-old kid in my office. Was, he didn't complain. I just did it. His levels were 207, just right at the end of normal. Mm -hmm. It's 23, by the way. This is normal, right? So I called this kid and I said, hey, you know, how do you feel? I feel great. Are you tired? Well, once in a while, do you recover from your workouts? No. And I asked this kid at 23, I remember having erections when I got up. Mm -hmm. How often do you get erections when you wake up? He sat there and said, you know what? I used to have them every day. I haven't had it for a few, now that you said that, that was around for a few weeks. And I said, what have you been doing? Well, I play football. So I'm going to talk about things that are happening now. Injuries to the brain. Yes. Car accidents, football, basketball, whatever. Two, toxins, xenoestrogen. The most common contaminant in blood is birth control pills, believe it or not. The most common contaminant in water is birth control pills, plastic bottles. They are actually toxins to the system. There's things that are affecting. Three, stress. It is huge. When you sit down and talk to that person, what's going on in your life? I'm always stressed. I'm always doing this that actually lower, lowers your testosterone levels, okay? Four, medications. I used to see 100 patients, two would be taking medications. I see 100 now, 90 I take in a medication. And out of that 90, 70 are taking two or more, which is crazy. Antidepressant, anti-ulcer, blood pressure medication. And did the doctor talk to you? And we are guilty of treating symptoms, not cause. So how often do I see low testosterone levels? If you don't come to my office looking for that, about 40 to 50%, which is insane. I wanna circle back real quick to the hormone optimization just because Merrick Health is a sponsor of the podcast. <laughs> and I told everybody I was gonna keep him up to date with that. So. I got my labs back. He he looked. Eric is obviously going to be the one. So I haven't spoke to the practitioners yet, which I will, and then I'll compare to you know what he's told me. But the the labs, the the way the setup for the labs is it's very good. It, it, it's it's better than I, I've seen. actually. That's better than any any other lab that I've seen. That was absolutely amazing. Is that the baseline? That is excellent. Yes. Yeah, so the so just for the update on that, the baseline testing is it, it, it's. it's it's obviously easier to read. And I don't even have nothing to do with that. I'm just telling you that was excellent. Yes. 